So hello and good afternoon and welcome to our panel, a panel about uh, music becoming moving pictures and a panel about classic becoming pop. So it's quite a big scope that we tried to touch. Uh, the organizers gave us two hours to do so. Uh, 15 minutes we already spent it by starting late. and. Uh, to be honest, you will have got a chance to raise questions later on, um, but uh, we would be surprised, even within your questions, if we really need the entire two hours. Hope hopefully, it will be a nice time where you will meet people like Martin Hoffmann, to my far right. Uh, Martin is the former MD and later CEO of Sat1, which was uh, or still is a big German private TV channel. Then became CEO of Me, Myself, and I, which I knew in the beginning as a video production company that later on did great reality TV shows like Bauer sucht Frau. Uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and after after really investing his time, this kind of high culture, um, he moved on to Berliner Philharmonica, uh, where he nowadays is the intendant of the Berliner Philharmonica and does some interesting things on the internet we want to talk about with him later on. Uh, next to him is Martin Hosbach whose claim to fame is that he was a trainee in an excellent company called Motor Music, which is my company, uh, and uh, that happened ages ago. Then he became an assistant of a classical director in uh, Berlin, Christian von Borries. Uh, his music became music creator for Berghain, which is a club uh, famous for drugs and late night excess. Uh, Went over to Electronic Beach with his, uh, Beats with his, uh, Deutsche Telekom and uh, now works as a creator for Haus der Berliner Festspiele. Uh, I think after this career his parents are finally calming down. Uh, and is producer of the One Hit Parade, uh, an internet TV uh, music show we want to talk about later. To my left uh, is Jan, a young husband who started uh, with the opera festival in Glidenburn, which I think is the one thing that's the most British thing you could do in your life. Uh, a lovely festival where you have picnics between sheep and uh, can have the greatest operas at the very same time. Uh, went over to the National Theatre, the West End Theatre, and then suddenly uh, to Channel 4 in uh, 1999, which became Commissioner of Arts and Performance. 2009, you went over to BBC, where you're the commissioning editor for music and event. Uh, 250 hours uh, TV time produced by yourself. So we want to talk about that and this vast amount uh, of music that you are working with. Another guy who works with a lot of music is to my far left. It's uh, Hartwig Masoch who studied economy and at the very same time, I think, was uh, the manager of a punk band in Germany. Uh, as a conclusion of this economy and punk, he became an independent publisher. Uh, later on, he went to the majors, uh, which was Warner Chapel, where he became the uh, GM in 87, uh, went to BMG Music Publishing in 91, were then sold by BMG to Universal, consequently left, and started all over new again with BMG Rights Management. Nowadays he is the, C the global CEO of BMG Rights uh, Management. Recently he is expanding uh, after he collected a lot of publishing catalogues and masters. Uh, he's also expanding into moving pictures, into uh, music on TV. I'm your host. My name is uh, Tim Renner and uh, I did join Polygram ages ago uh, as a journalist. Uh, failed with my story. I wanted to write. Ended up becoming... Oops becoming the CEO of uh, the company that that time was called uh, Universal after uh, a merger they made. I started my own company 10 years ago. 
and uh, it's called motor music and nowadays uh, motor music is not only involved into artist service we are also part of uh, TV concert like uh, Berlin Live uh, by Cobalt or uh, playlist by Pixio so that was a long introduction, I have to confess. Uh, that already made our first 10 minutes. Uh, but now I really want to jump into the real subjects. Uh, so we have to imagine there is somebody who produces uh, Bauer sucht Frau, uh, reality shows like this, and uh, suddenly you're a Berliner Philharmon uh, Philharmonics guy and uh, you're confronted with Martin Hoffmann coming around. Uh, haven't they been quite irritated to have got such a pop guy suddenly in front of them? And then, secondly, a thing happened that Martin came up with an idea uh, to stream the contents in the concerts in the internet. Wasn't that straight afterwards the second shock for the Berlin Philharmonics? Thank you, Tim, for this wonderful introduction. And um, I present myself as the former Bauer sucht Frau producer. Don't forget it during the whole discussion. And um, but to answer this quite seriously, it was a shock. I think at the beginning for both sides, so it, we both were wondering, even the Berlin Philharmonics, uh, as I do, as I did in the same uh, moment. But. Um, we came into contact with the Berlin Philharmonics in my times as I was CEO of Set One, and they try to figure out if we can broadcast a wonderful concert they are doing frequently once in a year, the so called Waldbühnen concert, and they asked me if I could imagine to uh, broadcast this on set one and I explained them it's very difficult our audience target crew is 14 to 49ers and they didn't understand what I was talking about but uh, at the end we became close friends and uh, with all the members or the representatives of the Berlin Philharmonics and after a while they asked me if I could imagine to join them and um, to work as an intendant or in English as a general manager and it was really a wonderful journey so far and it's uh, so different to everything I've done before but one thing you mentioned is this new um, digital distribution we organized and it was not my idea I tried to improve it a little bit but it was in 2009 and the orchestra was on tour in Taipei and this was a really wonderful moment and exciting and thrilling experience for all members of the orchestra because we did at the same time we did the concert in the hall and had an outside performance a public viewing for more than 8,000 people and after the concert the whole musicians went to this uh, to this public and uh, it was reaction you can compare it so far as pop stars we were celebrated or as musicians and this inspired um, one member of the group, the media director, a first solo cellist, Olaf Maninger, and he invented this idea to make a digital concert hall, a distribution platform for all the concerts uh, of the Berlin Philharmonics. And um, we are doing all together 140 concerts in a year, 90 here in Berlin, not far away from here, 100 meters. You can find our concert hall and um, it was at the beginning a quite interesting experience because everybody was so excited and so so convinced that this must work from the very first beginning and we started with one concert and um, the discussion at the beginning was should it be a paid content or not and because they were Berlin Philharmonics they always think it's impossible that you have not to pay for any content coming from the Berlin Philharmonic and so they decided to make an um, internet platform with uh, called DCH and you have to pay for every concert round about 13 euro that's this time and then um, it was at the beginning quite difficult or not so easy uh, but um, to be quite honest, uh, since one and a half year, we have something like a turnaround. We have more than 16,000 subscribers. They all have to pay. You can have a 12 months ticket or one month ticket. And we have now in the archive more than 200 concerts. 
That means it's kind of a repertoire of the whole Berlin Philharmonic um, repertoire. And uh, it becomes more and more successful because we add in the last time all the concerts coming from Claudio Abado. We bought the right spec. We have all the movies we did uh, as Berlin Philharmonics. Uh, so far, maybe you know it, uh, Rhythm is it, or Trip to Asia. It's also integrated. And that's it for the moment, and we are quite happy that um, also in the economic point of view, we could say this, the turnaround is upcoming soon. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's accepted by the audience, uh, it's accepted by them to pay, but why do you limit it to the internet? Like if you look at the Metropolitan Opera in uh, New York, what they do do real successful still doing is simply to broadcast it to cinemas and this is a success story even here in Germany people are this kind of cute nearly when you're going there you see people dressed up like going to the opera having their little champagne in their hands and uh, joining in a kind of sacred way uh, the cinema suddenly unfortunately we didn't invite you to our performance at cinema because we do it since now two years oh. <laughs> and uh, we do it in um, Germany with more than 70 cinemas and mm. uh, Europe wide altogether for, it depends on the uh, program and on the conductor but uh, close to 120 um, cinemas per concert but uh, it's difficult and it's different if you see an opera you have a scene you have actors you have so other emotional moments and it becomes more it's difficult only to have an, a concert a classical concert and so we decided to do it four times in a year in our, we are now in our third year, and we see it becomes relevant, but uh, it's, it's not, uh, we are not at the end of uh, this way, uh, but actually we see it's um, an alternative or additional way for our for, uh, distribution. Hey, you really should invite me. If you do, I will not mention... You are invited. We, well, I will not mention Bauer sucht Frau again, so I promised. Uh, but, but was this, is, is there a new role also of the cinemas coming up, uh, becoming some kind of venue? Because, like, yes, opera is something like a play, uh, but also pop concerts already happen in cinemas. Uh, Fantastische Vier, a German hip hop band, did in 2010, supported from Fraunhofer Institute, uh, a direct 3D screen into, I think, 21 cinemas. Uh, and now also a whole movie comes up uh, of the Wacken Festival, which is uh, the worldwide biggest metal festival uh, happening in 3D. And uh, trying to make Y 3D. This like read like a venue like uh, your concert hall around the corner. Can you imagine that this will be part of your future? Yes, um, and by chance we made a 3D movie for cinema um, one year ago. <laughs> And uh, we have it international in all cinemas, and it was uh, um, a journey to Singapore called, and it was um, a 3D movie to do with this technique to make a, a real good result uh, on screen with our music. It was not so easy. We, are, we were, were not totally convinced and um, it didn't fulfill our wishes how we should be broadcasted or how we should be shown uh, in a movie so this is uh, an experience we made and we uh, we were looking what we can do in this uh, this direction but it's not um, on the first uh, thing we uh, we are looking for we are more looking to uh, all the social media uh, channels and activities we are very very strong in this field and this is actually what we are looking for and um, but let me say one thing to the atmosphere in the cinema if you hear concerts we are doing it very close to the venue, 50 meters on the right hand side, it's a Sony center. And uh, it's, um, so we are neighbors. The concert hall and the cinema is uh, very close to, uh, together. And what we see is we have the same atmosphere and the same people coming to cinema and with the same attitude. They are really celebrating it. 
uh, and, uh, but you have to deliver further content. To only to do a one-to-one -one transmission of the concert is not enough for this, uh, uh, for this venue, for, for, for a cinema. And so we do additional commentaries, we have interviews with conductors and soloists to explain formats and programs and so on and so on. And um, at the end when you ask people, is, is something which is exactly the same or it come close to experience to the experience in the hall uh, they are not 100% convinced they're always saying it's great it's a good atmosphere it's a good idea and it gives us a chance to take part normally we are sold out at the concert and uh, it's also a chance for people who are not in Berlin to see our concerts, but it's not and this is quite clear we have to we have to say it's not the same and you can't you can compare it, but it's not exactly the atmosphere you have in the concert hall. And this should be the same thing in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, even though 3D might help, the, the director of photography who did your movie, that I know, uh, did also this fucking thing, and there you can see like how much the technique already yeah. progressed. And it's like, I think there's four years in between, and this four years in the technology way made a big, big difference. But coming back to the good old TV, which is uh, sitting next to me uh, in the form of a uh, young, young husband. Uh, is it so, working? Hmm? Yeah, it's is working. that working? Mm, yeah. Uh, when, when I, when I, what, it's on. When I, when I read it's that you're producing 250 hours of music content for TV, it uh, looked for me fantastic. Is it per week, per year, it's in the four or five uh, well, years? Well, it varies between, uh, it's per year, but it, and it varies. I mean, I think, um, you know, when I was a teenager, I used to dash home to watch Top of the Pops because that was the only way you could know, you know, what was happening. Um, and I remember sitting with my dad watching the operas on the TV because that was the only way you could get to see them. Because if you grew up in Portsmouth, we didn't have opera there. Um, <clears throat> but now you can get any music you want at the touch of a button. And that's the major difference. Um, so now broadcasters aren't just making TV. I mean, it's a big argument, what is TV? Because I watch all the online services on my TV in my living room. So it's also TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also, TV is now portable. And so it's, I, the BB, I can watch the, you know, the BBC Live on here or any channel in England live on my phone. So we're in a very different space. But the con we still have to make good content. And whether you're now, I mean, there was a time when you watched the internet on your laptop and television on your television. But now you watch the internet on your television and you watch television on your iPhone. So the idea that there's a television screen and an internet, it's actually all one screen, really. It's not a different screen, basically. And I think that's a, a very focusing thing. So there was a time when you'd go, um, well, I used to produce operas for TV, um, multi-camera operas, and um, you know, you had the opera on TV and that was it. And then the next thing was you had a website. And the website was a very exciting thing because you could write a bit of information about your opera, you know. But, I mean, now the audience, firstly, they, doesn't, they don't watch the opera when you put it on TV, usually because they've already seen it because it's been streamed in the cinema or it's been on the Guardian website or one of the newspapers. Um, so firstly, we see now that audiences don't watch opera on TV. Um, and the other thing we see with audiences is that they choose when they watch it. And that's kind of wonderful, really, because on the one hand, you can put Glyndebourne on, say, on Saturday night at 8 o'clock, and it's, uh, think of an opera, Rosen Cavalier or something, um, and you think, marvellous, three and a half hours of opera, I'll lie on my couch and, you know, I'll, you know, I'll have a glass of wine, it'll be jolly nice. But our audiences don't watch for that long. You know, they watch a bit, and then they catch it up later. And I think the main focus for us now is in the old days, we used to make fabulous television, as we still try to do now. Um, but now we're dealing in with, a, with, a, with the, audience <clears throat> the audience deciding when they want to watch things. I mean, they still need access, but the audience decides. But in all of the technology, the content still needs to be brilliant. So you're always going to want to see the Berlin Philharmonic. Mm. And I think the Digital Concert Hall is incredible, and I wish we could do that for the proms. Because I think access to great culture is something that 
our audiences want, and we know that because they, they come and wherever you put it, they'll come and get it in the cinema, on the phone, or anywhere. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily. Um, you know, we shouldn't be. Um, we shouldn't worry about the technology, but we should worry about whether we're making good content. And good content sometimes has to do with budget. What we experience often here in Germany is uh, that you don't get good quotation, you don't get a lot of viewers uh, with music content, with uh, mm -hmm. classical music content, and especially on the normal TV stations, but you get mm -hmm. a lot of catch-up later uh, via the internet, even the show that we are involved with, uh, yes. Berlin Live, which is rock pop, has yes. got uh, much higher viewers on internet than normally has yes, got well, uh, on normal te television. Right. Yeah. But, but that normally doesn't reflect uh, the budget that you have got, because I think the <laughs> TV stations still thinks in case of uh, how much viewers do I have got on TV? I'm yes, well, sure. we're obviously, I mean, when I started in TV, you know, there were two channels doing what I do. Um, now there are four channels and there's endless online sites, iPlayer, Red Button, you know, so many different places to see your film. YouTube, you know, there's all the music all over Spotify, there's all the radio stations there also online and all radio is also filming itself. So there's a lot of stuff, but for instance in the case of the BBC, we are you know, instead of having to fund uh, two channels, we're funding four and we're funding all the online and all the websites and everything else for the same money. So that's why the budgets are less, because the budgets have got to go further to fund all this technology. Um, and uh, I think you know it's absolutely true that we're asked to make things for less money than we had before, and I think it makes it very difficult for producers. It's another reason why partnership is from co and co-production is incredibly important, which is why this market is so important. But um, I think the you know, but what that's one of the issues is actually expecting to have more for more money for it, but actually the money's having to stretch further. In a, with a public broadcaster, the great issue for us is, say, 10 years ago, uh, if you were lucky, maybe you'd get maybe a million people watching an opera. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but for a very prestigious title with a huge star. Now you will get 40,000 people watching an opera on television. But operas cost a certain amount of money, not because they're expensive, but because there are a lot of people on the stage. Like ballets, you know, a lot of people there. Orchestras, all the cast, the chorus, all the stagehands. Um, so they still cost the same. An opera costs the same to shoot as it did when I was shooting them, um, when I was a producer in the 90s. They still cost the same. But they... Um, uh, you know they haven't they haven't got cheaper. They cost the same. But the problem as a public service broadcaster, if you spend two hundred sixty thousand on something that only forty thousand people want to watch, and you're spending the public's money, um, the the broadcaster starts to say, well, there are more people. You know, is this the right way to spend the money? Is this the right way? So with opera, for instance, I think cinema has been brilliant for opera because um, for the opera house itself, uh, we would put the opera on telly and it was a piece of marketing, but now it goes in the cinema, the opera house benefits from that because it's like extra tickets. And then we can take the opera down the line because the opera houses want to share in their rights, it makes it cheaper for television. And so television feels more relaxed about doing it because um, you don't feel that you're making, spending a lot of money on something that nobody wants to watch. Uh, with rock and roll, the big thing is streaming. So now we find our, we stream five stages at Glastonbury now. Uh, we did that for the first time last year. Um, and uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. Uh, the viewing audience for the streaming is higher, unless it's, you know, the Rolling Stones obviously was a huge audience. But the streaming mostly, the audience is bigger than on the television. And so the big problem is, is the streaming damaging the television or simply is it that the audience just wants to watch the content, you know, when, they want, when they're free? I mean, our, basically we shoot the streaming the same way we shoot the TV. So in terms of how we make the content, it's the same production value. It just depends where you're watching it. But the content is the same content. But isn't that exactly what you have to learn as uh, television? That you have to do this kind of double play? Because that is pretty much when you look like the end of MTV, the end of Viva in Germany, uh, all the m all music channels that used to be for pop yes. music so important and uh, disappeared. Uh, 
uh, didn't they miss out exactly what you're talking about, that you have got this kind of double play between television and uh, internet? Well, I think we're still talking about television and internet as if they're two separate things, but we do watch both on the same screen. I think that's the new point, really, that I don't have to change screens to watch it. It, well, you know, if I can open this and it's got red button, iPlayer, all the BBC channels, ITV and Channel 4 on it, all of that when I'm at home in my country. <laughs> um, and so, but it's on my phone. And is that, that's all TV, but it's on my phone. If you sort of mean. So, so the, the only difference for so you is, is live or on demand? internet, streamed or whatever you're calling it, the fundamental product is the content and it, where you receive, you know, what it's called is where you receive it. So it's a subtle point perhaps, but do you see what I mean? Is that too complicated? It's just, you know, you can film an opera and if you say, oh, it's a streamed opera or it's on TV or it's on the iPlayer or it's on whatever, you know, it's on a website, the fact is the thing is still the same thing. <laughs> It's still a multi-camera opera, so that's the content. Yeah, the only difference is one time it's live, mm. or it's you 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 yeah, well, don't you don't decide when to watch it, uh, and the other one you decide. Things I can put it out live. I can say, here's a live opera <laughs> from you know, here's a live concert from the Berlin Philharmonic. My audience will say, great, thanks a lot. I'm going out for dinner. I'll watch it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so all those tricks we used to play in telly, where we used to go, right, we'll put it on after the football. The beat you know, six million people watching the football and then they'll all watch the Berlin Philharmonic because they'll stay on for that. Well, now they're awful, the audience, because they say, well, you can put it there, but I'm not going to watch it until I'm ready. So things like the big shows on ITV, I remember, I think it was Britain's Got Talent, they said that like 75% of the audience were watching it the next day, watching it on catch-up. So the catch-up figures for us are sometimes bigger than the, the actual viewing figures. And now we have accumulated figures, so we don't worry about it anymore. Okay. Okay, that's for sure something to learn in Germany, <laughs> uh, because we normally don't accumulate. Um, and that sounds pretty much like good news. If TV has got the relaxed view that it's saying, like, it, it, it's not about the screen, it's about uh, when you watch it, and this increases even the chance to be watched. Uh, the bad news part, of course, is the budget end uh, talking about. And I just want to ask the gentleman next to me, if you're producing a TV show for internet, uh, how big is the budget of one hit parade? Yeah, it's called, it was funny you mentioning uh, Top of the Pops, because this was the original inspiration for my show which is called the one hit parade so I'm just I'm the one deciding on which is a hit or, or not so there are no charts because I think I've got the best taste in music and uh, and also one hit is of course I'm taking pardon my French the piss because I think the bands that I show have more than one hit but I just really love the term one hit so there's this uh, institution by the uh, by the mayor of Berlin called Music Board uh, Berlin. Uh, you can see their logo to my right, and uh, they were they started um, on the first of January in uh, 2013, and they are there to support the Berlin-based pop industry. Uh, pop industry means. They, you can apply for funding if you're a mus musician, you can apply for funding if you're someone like me who just deals in ideas, um, you can apply for funding if you're a label. Um, so, and only through hearing that they were there, I thought, okay, what can I do to help the Berlin-based Berlin -based musicians, so they don't have to be German, they just have to live here. What can I do to support them? Because there's so much great talent in the city and I sometimes I think they are, there's a, they are lacking a, a platform. Um, I applied for 54,000 euros uh, and I got 40. So with these 40,000 euros, I was able to record 16 bands. I couldn't do it live, but then I realized, wow, this is even more amazing to do playback because this is like the original old school concept. And, uh, and within, I mean, today it's all about authenticity. I'm somehow against authenticity. I really love 
playback. And no, because it's really it's interesting what happens if, I mean, I had to explain the concept to more or less each and every band because they didn't know what playback was. Because they are like 18, 20, 25, 28. They, did, they didn't know Top of the Pops. They didn't know the old gray whistle test. They didn't know Soul Train. They didn't know Formel 1. They didn't know anything. So, Deutsche Hitparade by Dieter Thomas Heck. Yeah. So, uh, but it's funny what you what 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 happens when a band doesn't have to focus on playing the right notes. They somehow s they focus on the actual on the performance and how it, on, and on the props. And also, of course, it's I mean, and some really got the concept. And they were I mean, there was one saxophone player who was playing when there was no saxophone. And this is what I always found so hilarious back in the days because you could actually see whether was some someone was trying to play the correct notes or if someone just couldn't be bothered if he or she was maybe more interested in, in looking good. So I got 40,000 euros. With that 40,000 euros I record, we recorded 16 bands. Each band got 300 euros. Um, and then I spent around 15,000 on the actual production. So we had three cameras, um, two assistants, it was mixed live, uh, mixed by the, well, the I, I got really good help from, from um, people who do a Monday evening show on Pro 7, which is called Circus Haligali. So they they thought the concept was really good. Um, my concept was really good. So they helped, and they each got maybe a couple of hundred euros each. And we it took us 30 hours to record it. And now you you can see I've got um, I uh, I placed postcards on your tables. Um, It'll be premiered on the internet, uh, on YouTube, and on our website, on Muzu TV, and also on uh, Alex TV, which is the Berlin-based. Um, it's I don't know what the correct English term is. It's like a free public TV. Yeah. Um, so the premiere will be next Saturday. So how will people know about it? If, if they're not by accident in this room and find one of your postcards on your table, how will they know about the existence of this? Because that's a big difference between good old television, where it suddenly comes up, and uh, you might join in later, but uh, it, it comes up. How will they know about your show? Well, we... Um um, we we did. Uh, I mean, we are quite strong, I think, with in all the like social media channels. And uh, because I used to work for as a journalist for so many years, I've got good contacts. Um, so I just asked my my friends whether they could support the one hit parade and just write about it. So um, this week. Hopefully, all the newspapers in Germany will will be full with uh, info uh, on the one hit parade. So I'm going to Deutschland Radio tomorrow, and there's an interview at Flux FM with me. So I'm just, um, yeah, I'm trying to get as much press as possible, um, and then we will spend money on Facebook ads, Google ads, and um, and there will and there are also posters in town. So just uh, the old, I really like posters. Um, so we did like several thousand posters. Yeah. Okay, look, well, what made me kind of nervous is the fact that we have got people like Wolfgang Bergmann, head of Arte in the room, and you talking about 40,000 euro uh, and 16 bands. Uh, forget about this, Wolfgang. Um, so w what actually is your business model behind this? Well, the, yeah, it's well, it's maybe well, it's a bit fun. Well, it's a good question, but the uh, well, the um, the business model is I try to make money um, in other places, um, <laughs> and um, I mean, I wish I wouldn't mind being on. TV or on the internet and getting properly paid for it. On the other hand, I mean, you could. Well, the idea wouldn't. I wouldn't have had the idea if it wasn't for the institution called Music Board. So the business model is trying to get uh, funding from from the state that I pay tax for or at. Um, so I'm using tax payers' money for these ideas. And I think the result is um, more interesting than 
most of what you see that is also funded by taxpayers' money. <laughs> so as a taxpayer, um, <laughs> do I have got the chance, Hartwig, that one day you buy this stuff and uh, the state is not needed anymore because you're expanding into uh, pictures suddenly? And, and why are you doing so? So it sounds like a proper business to simply buy publishing catalogs and have got the master rights of acts like Nina, Backstreet Boys, uh, and whoever, like the so big names, uh, and suddenly you're doing a new business saying, uh, get, getting into moving uh, pictures with music. Why, Ed? Okay, and um, when will you buy Hossi? I have to look at it, but uh, <laughs> obviously there's a little context in, in what we do, and uh, as Tim said, we started basically five years ago completely new in the music industry, Bertelsmann, which is our parent company, had always big record companies like RCA or the old BMG big artists, but in mid of uh, 2005, 2006, they, they really looked at it and said the new world in this industry driven by digitization will require very different capabilities in the music industry and basically we had one headline is which the mogul of the past in the music industry will be out this guy sitting there and a young girl comes in and say baby I make you a star dye your hair and sing a Swedish song probably not enough to <laughs> Sweden, good, good songwriters in Sweden probably not enough so the, the basic analysis was what will a, industry have to basically offer to clients, clients defined as a creative talent in a digitized world because digitization is about massive power change in this industry and I think it would take too long to explain it but if you look at production, if you look at distribution, all these bottlenecks of the traditional music industry are history. This is no longer in the uh, wor uh, world of Apple, iTunes, of social media, of digitized production. It's no longer a bottleneck. Where there is another complexity is obviously the marketing side. And, and when, when we looked at it and said, okay, pretty easy, we can A, create fantastic database for production once we own repertoire. And I think we own an amazing catalog which we bought over the last five years and developed new artists. That is easy. But how do you basically make sense out of the marketing side of it? And, and again, you have to look back at then historically and say actually what created the modern music industry. And if you get over the big egos of executives in the music industry, find out basically everything in several stages was based on film or TV. And actually this week is a quite interesting interesting week 50 years ago, the Beatles who created the modern music industry. And it's, it's really, music industry is a little different from the sort of assembly of labels or record companies in the 60s. It became a music industry in the late 60s, 70s, 80s. And what was triggering it was TV. It was the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, which created an enormous big relevance for music in the United States. It was later the big festivals and their basically their performance in films. Remember Woodstock, how few of those acts would have ever crossed the Atlantic if it would not have been for the Woodstock film. It was later, even when people today say about, oh, there was U2 or Pink Floyd, and then look back and say, actually, what created U2? Well, it was uh, the Life Aid concert. Nobody in Germany actually could, would have bothered about U2 in a lot of other countries. So we looked at this whole scenario, and hopefully this was not too quick, and said there's one essential tool which we hof have to offer if we can offer finance, if we can ho offer digital distribution, if we can offer management of database, which is access to audiovisuals. And, and I think that it's critically important for artists going forward to control that channel and work with broadcasters outside of the world of the major labels. Because what a major label does, or a traditional record company, they would buy advertising based on videos they produce and basically charge all the money back from artists. I think what the BBC showed and a couple of other programs is there's a, if the artist is in control, there's a win-win situation. Like the Rolling Stones at Hyde Park, basically the marketing platform that was historically charged extremely expensive back to artists by record companies suddenly becomes a profit center if you look at a worldwide scope. And actually there was a lot of records sold. Or here in Germany, I don't know whether you followed the campaigns Vox had, like the X XXL formats, where suddenly the programming of music became a profit center for artists. That's our thought behind it. So as much as we can actually support and develop audiovisual strategies for our artists, we will do it. Okay, but if I understand your business model correctly, like in the field of music, you say like the creative person 
became much, much more independent thanks to digital because suddenly the costs involved into production are much lower. And now you're making the next step and saying the same pretty much happens also with visuals uh, getting cheaper if you work cleverly digitally. So like all the labels, the traditional labels are kind of shivering nowadays when they hear your name or the name BMG Rights Management. Uh, will the same thing happen to a lot of guys here who are now into TV production and uh, have got Hartwig and Battlesman coming around getting into the business? No, actually, I mean, we have no expertise in TV production, so well, some of our sister companies have, but obviously we team up with TV producers, but what they need is then the buy-in of the artists we work with and r uh, rational budgets and then and, and what we always offer to artists, which is very important, is ownership. We, we are not insisting on ownership. So I think what the production industry, whether it's film or TV, will face is a little the same pressure points that the music industry experienced over the last 20 years. That the power will change a little bit. Some of the clients will get more important clients not being maybe the uh, broadcasters or uh, big uh, production houses uh, or the big studios, but the creative talent behind it, the directors, the producers, I think they will get much more leverage in this industry than ever before. And also new channels will come up. Like, How do you view uh, new independent uh, channels that develop very fast on YouTube? Like, for example, one is based in Germany and is the biggest one in Europe, Mediacraft. Uh, just a few kids from Cologne uh, being extremely successful and making a lot of uh, money also for the artist uh, by doing so. Is, is that the one key tool for you uh, as a new turnover of the future? Yes, I mean, obviously you need more channels because if you look at the traditional broadcast world, there is not enough room to have a, like a comprehensive outlet for a very diversified and even more uh, fragmented music market. So there will be a lot of web-based uh, uh, new companies who actually even open new markets. And it was interesting when we talked about uh, uh, life experience versus web-based streaming. And, and, and I mean, let's, let's face it, the big bands we have nowadays, they can't go to all the markets that become potentially relevant music markets. So it has to be based on audiovisual c content actually to, to market those bands in the new territories. So if you, I, mean, I recently flew to Beijing and, and I think seven hours out of nine I was flying over Russia and I said, no, I understand why no act is actually really be able to work physically a market like Russia or China because they don't have the time for that. I mean, it was interesting. I spoke to one of our big bands recently and said, so where did you go for the last half year? What, what was the holiday resort? And they said, no, we toured South America. So it was one of our bigger bands who was who played four months big, big arenas in South America. So they need actually, if they want to cover the world, audiovisual strategies and, and, and channels who work worldwide and that by definition will be streaming channels, internet based channels. But that it also will mean that for some people in this room they suddenly will become a channel and not only production anymore. Because if, if I follow up the logic that you're doing in music and say the same thing happens in audiovisual uh, production, it will pretty much, uh, there will be pretty much a new competition also for BBC by people like uh, TV production companies simply opening up their own channel and doing their own thing. I think, yeah, I think that's true, but I don't, I, it doesn't, it's not so worrying. I think it's kind of great because it's access, isn't it? I mean, I think. The, the thing we face mostly is just making good content. I mean, um, you know, it's different with rock and roll because obviously bands now are very wealthy. Uh, there's a huge audience because the audience that grew up with the Beatles and Mick Jagger are now mm. 70, like they are. Um, so you've got this huge older audience who still tip up at Glastonbury. And you've also got this very young audience who think that if it's on telly, it's already old news. I mean, 16-year-olds tell me that, I say, do you want me to bring back Top of the Pops, you know? Uh, they're not interested in the chart. They say by the time it's in the chart, you know, they've already got it and it's old news. Because the traction for young people is to get it before anyone knows about it, to collect it on their phone and go, yeah, I bet you haven't got this, you know. Uh, that's what they're into. They don't really care about what's number one. Whereas the way Top of the Pops worked was by the audience, sort of the audience created Top of the Pops by, you know, buying the albums. But it's a, it's done, it's different. The market is different now. The bands, the bigger bands, uh, the wealthier bands make their own films because they want to own the rights. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but actually that works to our benefit because if they own the rights, we can maybe get it for a little cheaper, which helps us because our license fee's been frozen. So we don't we don't just have more money, you know, even if we wanted to have more money, we don't. Um, but the bands are saying now, we don't need you, we're, we're rich, we can hire a film director, we'll, you know, Beyonce made a, her own film, Coldplay made their own film. Uh, we invest in those films, we buy the rights because we believe it's our duty as the BBC to make sure that we deliver to our our paying audience the best possible music th that we can get for them. So, um, you know, the Rolling Stones were at Glastonbury and in Hyde Park. We knew that we had to do both, you know, that, it, that our audience would want us to deliver both for them. Um, and, um, you know, in that case, you know, we were very actively involved, but at other times, you know, we, we work with the Rolling Stones a lot, say all these big bands, um, but they like to own their films now. They don't want us to own them. Um, the rights issues for us are in some ways more complex than other, ever and in other ways rather great because in a time when everyone's struggling for money, if the band is prepared to put some money into their own film, that's jolly good. We then have a problem because what, we can't, what you can't do in broadcasting is let a rock band make a film about themselves and put it on television when their album's being released because that is marketing. You know, that's an advert. And so we have to be very careful that the, you know, the album goes out and then the film goes out later. So it's not promotion, promoting the album. But I think we have to be realistic that big rock musicians and, you know, the mostly bigger musicians, they're coming through in promotional windows and television is part of that. And along the way, they're very generous to us because they give their time to be, take part in documentaries. And, you know, that element of content is, I think, where the heartland is for our audience audience anyway, whereas the performance is available ev everywhere anyway. So we're not so worried about the performance, we're more worried about the journalism of, you know, the unpacking the stories of how great music is made. That's, I think that's what television really does well. If, if I'm traveling to the UK and I'm talking to people who could be my parents uh, by age, and you can believe they're pretty old then. Um, I find out you can still talk with them about pop music. So, like when you have got a 70 year old uh, cab driver, he still knows about the, old, the new Damon yeah, yeah. Albarn record, uh, which is totally different uh, to Germany, where the generation oh. of my parents had to decide uh, when they were grown ups to get rid of rock and roll and pop. Oh. And if you're well educated, you go into jazz and classics. And if not that well, you go end up with Schlager and Fox music. Um, so, but, but there the interest still goes on. Is it that, that in UK oh, yes, the people don't so. dif differentiate that much? No, I mean, if you, go, if you went out to a club in London, you find the parents out with their, their teenagers. You know, the 50 year old parents are out dancing and rocking and rolling because they grew up with it. And the 16 and 17 year olds are kind of there with their parents sometimes. It's a, it's a you know, and Glastonbury's, you know, babies. It's People bring their babies <laughs> and they bring their grandparents. I mean, it's a huge, very, you know, diverse audience, but it's, it's rather wonderful, really, because obviously the, the generation that grew up with this music still wants to hear it, but also they still want to hear the new stuff. But are they also you have to cater for that. But are they also into classics and jazz, or is it kind of... Well, I think the most, the most frightening for me, really, is op the loss of the opera audience on television. So I love opera, and I've m sort of messed around with opera, made films, and done all kinds of stuff, because I think the screen's very inspiring for opera for me. Um, but actually, why it's changed is because the opera houses are going into cinema, and actually that makes total sense, because they get some money from that. For the audience, you think, great, I can dress up, go out with my friends, to the opera down the road in the local cinema, I can have my glass of champagne and I can have the, the effect of a night out at the opera. I can see the Met or I can see, you know, these fab, you know, Glyndebourne, whatever. Um, and I can, you know, I can have an experience as if I'd gone to Glyndebourne, but it's cost me 30 pounds, not 130 pounds. And anyway, you wouldn't get a ticket for Glyndebourne unless, I mean, you just can't um, any more than you get a ticket for the Met, probably. So I think. The, 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 you know, in a way, what's sad for TV is we've sort of, that audience is now in the cinema, uh, but now we work with the big companies so that we co-create their cinema work, and then we put the opera on television afterwards and try not to worry when only 40,000 people watch it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's complicated, but the, the op, there's def in England anyway, I, well, certainly we feel, you see it across all our broadcasters, there's, there's a really, really low audience 
for straight classical performance and opera on television now. Isn't that, isn't that not even a kind of double threat, not only that you're losing people uh, to cinema and to other channels, it's also on other channels a lot of things are not explained. So when you're going into uh, music that has got a big history, like classical music, uh, you normally need some explanation, some workarounds that you easily, more easy mm. can do on TV than on a streaming that just is happening. Yes. Uh, well, somewhere. I think obviously streaming is great. You know, who wouldn't want to have the opportunity to see the Berlin Philharmonic do everything they do? I mean, you just want to be able to see that. If, you know, we believe in making music for fat the fans. Um, you know, I would stream all the proms, but, you know, again, we have a rights issue about, you know, because sometimes orchestras can't be streamed because they've got a video deal or something, but, um, or a cinema deal, but, um, you know, in an ideal world, everything would be streamed because this is incredible content and that provides access. But if you're talking about making a television program, our audience likes context. So when we do the proms, we put, there are 80 concerts in the season, they're all on radio live, and then we put 30 of them on television, between 28, 26 and 30 on TV a year. And uh, last year we decided to give them a shape because our audience said, well, they're just 28 concerts and they kind of pop up. You know, why that 28 and why not this 28? You know, well, how do you choose? And I thought, well, I don't choose. I choose with all my colleagues, obviously not, it's not just my personal choice or anything. So last year we decided to theme them. So when you turn them into proper telly, the audience recognizes that. So we said, okay, Thursday nights are orchestras of the world. And we had a narrative that ran through the Thursday nights. And they, the viewing figures went up and everybody noticed them because the audience thought they were going to get a story, not just a concert. And our television audience likes context and stories and great journalism. And they like to meet the, so they like to have the best seat in the house and they like to hear um, Sir Simon Rattle explain how to conduct Marla. And then they, you can put the, give them a Mahler symphony and they'll maybe watch 15 minutes of it. They're more interested in the explanation than they are in watching the concert mm -hmm. on TV. And then they'll listen to the music, you know, whatever. Great, and uh, you can drive people to it, which is, I think, in Germany a bit more difficult because we really have got this strict border between E and U. Ernste Musik and Unterhaltungsmusik, uh, serious music and just entertaining uh, music. Did you, when you were at the, all these GEMA meetings, which is a German copyright authori uh, authorization, ever understood this kind of big frontier that's built up there? Well, I, first of all, I never went there, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I never was Lucky a you. big fan of this uh, industry bodies that basically circle around themselves. No, uh, actually it's a question of power and, and you have to see that uh, historically the classical composers were the founders of GEMA and they, over years, like up to the mid-50s, uh, had the... Uh, basically the power to vote for uh, distribution schedules in, in, in their favor, like in France, by the way. And that's, that's the only reason. And so far, it wasn't able to overcome it. There's absolutely no reason for it except power in voting. Mm -hmm. But this power actually makes their life more difficult, especially in, in Germany, where you have got often the feeling like this classical music is the earnest, the not fun stuff, and there is a lot of fun stuff happening on the other end side. Uh, you tried actually to crash this border when you involved yourself with a thing called Yellow Lounge. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, although I've uh, talked about uh, Top of the Pops and my own uh, hit parade format, uh, I started learning to play the piano when I was five, so when I started my internship at Polygram and then later called Universal Music, um, when I finished the internship I started working in the classical uh, music department um, which was then called Universal Classics and I was responsible, my title was Junior Product Manager Frontline Classics which meant I had to take care of new releases of uh, Deutsche Grammophon, Decker and Philips and there was one guy in Sweden called Ruth de Serra uh, who worked at Universal Classics International Marketing Department in London, I think, at the time. And he had this idea of um, DJs playing classical music at a club. So r right before I, um, I finished my internship and started working as a junior product manager, Frontline Classics, 
Um, they had an, in an, an international meeting in Vienna, and there was there they had the first yellow lounge, um, and that was it. And then my boss Christian Kellersmann, um, who was head of the jazz and classics department, asked me whether I wanted to develop that. Uh, concept and I was already a DJ playing records in one or two of the cool clubs in Hamburg and then and I also knew a, a bit about classical music because I had always been playing the piano um, so I we started renting small venues and then it was me and another friend playing classical music and that was more or less it. It became quite uh, hip at the beginning and uh, there was an article in Spiegel, which is the, the weekly, biggest German weekly uh, magazine, um, and there was, there was a sort of buzz around us playing classical music at a club. But there was really nothing more to it. And then we decided, okay, maybe we should have artists playing in between the sets um, and that that was a, that was a turning point I think the yellow lounge became more popular and then my story ends already because I couldn't stand working anymore at a big major record company uh, so I left and when I left uh, the yellow La lounge became even more successful um, <laughs> And today you've got the Yellow Lounge, I think maybe, well, not every month, but maybe every two or three months in like really the coolest clubs you have in Berlin, like um, uh, Berghain or Cookies. And you've got between, I don't know, maybe 500 and 1,200 people coming there. And the audience is quite, well, it's quite young. I, quite a few of them don't, I don't think, go to the Philharmonie, although, I mean, I would always advise anyone going to the Philharmonie. But because it's at Berghain, it's a club that is more, maybe they are more familiar with, they just go there and they are fine with, for example, Lang Lang performing for 20 minutes. That's already, for quite a few people, that's already there enough of their, uh, like, monthly dose of classical music. Um, um, which is fine. But, you know, I mean, originally, and this is, at one point, I was really fed up. I realized, I don't know, it's just, basically, it's just marketing somehow. And I would rather have, I'd rather have someone explain to me why Debussy and Ravel are great composers in a maybe, in an, in an inviting way. At the end of the day, I don't think that the 1,000 people that go to Berghain maybe and see Lang Lang play for 20 minutes, I don't really know if they then go out to Dis Dusman the next day and buy Lang's, Lang, Lang Lang's new, in brackets, boring recording of, um, I don't know, again, the same, same Chopin or whatever. Um, uh, it's, I've, well, yeah. At least it's. I would, I would be more positive. I would say at least it's a starting point that people uh, get confronted with it. That people, that classic goes and classic culture goes into uh, clubs. So the, it's moving towards where the people are. Uh, do you have the same thing at the Philharmonie? That the Philharmonie is moving more towards people who come out of another context. I know that you have got some activities going there. No, we, we, have, we do it since years and years, I would say, but it's, there is a very special situation we are really focused on. It means a concert, our concert hall. You can do the best concerts in this hall, and it's the best quality and the best. So although the whole venue is so exciting and thrilling, so what we are doing is try to make a free or to improve the access even for young audience. That doesn't mean that we don't go outside. We are uh, every 1st of May, we do a uh, Europe the birthday concert of the Berlin Philharmonic found in 1882. And we are going to very different, very exciting venues all over Europe. We are performing in Oxford Library or in, in Athens um, in very, very uh, um, surprising venues. But the most thing we are actually organizing, the most important thing we are organizing is that uh, we try to get the younger audience into our hall. 
or to make some offers outside which are related to our music and to the hall. We have done since 10 years this wonderful dance project, uh, Simon Rattle, uh, uh, founded in 2002. And this was really, every year we had 3,000 young pupils and students uh, in this hall with 120 dancing students on stage. And now we have a new project called Vocal Heroes, which is going outside in, in different um, parts of the city and try to collect some young singers and that uh, uh, the goal is that they are able to do a concert together with the Berlin Philharmonic in the venue. We are doing family concerts in the hall and this is a very very thrilling moment. If you're sitting there you have 2,200 seats in the hall and only 1,100 are really taken. And I was asking what what's wrong with this concert and the reason why is because the younger people are sitting together with their parents and only one seat is taken even when are when these are two persons so and we are doing so-called uh, uh, concerts going outside in different uh, social hot spots like in prisons or in, in we are doing concerts there and um, so it's a, a lot of a wide a wide range of activities to um, to make an offer for this uh, next generation, even when we know it's not so diff it's not so easy. What we don't do is to make our music or our content or what what we think what our music should be. In uh, we don't reduce the quality. We think the music must stand for its uh, uh, with. Uh, their own quality they have and don't to reduce made bits and pieces and explaining interruptions so we have a certain kind of culture in the concert and we try to get people the younger uh, generation to find what the procedure is and what uh, the structure is and what the content is to make to give some expectations uh, to make it easier but we don't disturb or, or change the content itself. Which yeah. might be one of the yeah. key messages here and maybe also a little way to, to sum things up here where we have got the, the message from Martin, Martin one, uh, saying uh, focus on the content, focus on the quality of your content, go where your possible consumer is, wherever he, she is, uh, if I reach uh, them via the nets and streaming, or so if I have to go to a prison to play there, go there and do your high quality content. I understand uh, Martin too, Martin Hosbach, uh, that you have to simply just think out of the box, that you have to dare things. If it's an idea like uh, the Yellow Lounge and picking it up, if it's an idea like the One Hit Parade and getting state subvention for pop, uh, just dare it, try it, might work. And I understand you with your clear message, uh, it's not about different devices, uh, it's one screen at the end of the day and the only thing is that there are more possibilities, which is good news uh, if we so end up. I, I think with Lang Lang, I'd like to say something about Lang okay. Lang. Can I say something about Lang Lang? I mean, I think Lang Lang's yeah. extraordinary. Um, I, I, he came to do Beethoven in the Royal Albert Hall and the audience was just a completely different audience to the audience that we would have in the proms. Uh, but the newspapers in England said, no, he can't really play, you know, he's not very really good. And, he's a and I, I think there's an appalling snobbery in classical music. And I think we all need to just stop it because you know there are a lot of people who'd love to go to the opera and can't afford a ticket a lot of people would love to come to the berlin philharmonic and can't even get a ticket and they're not even sure if they you know an opera if you want to spend 200 pounds on a ticket for something you might not like that's quite a big deal and i think what cinema has done for opera is allowed people to come uh, you know you don't have to dress up you can if you want uh, so it sort of opened it up i completely agree with your comment that the 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 content needs to be good but when you 
you've got sort of part of your audience who knows that Lang Lang's arpeggios aren't quite smooth and okay, fine. And then you've got another half of that audience who don't know that and are just enjoying the music. And I think we, we need, we, we're so lucky now that we have these exciting artists. When I was a child, I, I used to watch music on TV all the time. That was the only way you could get it. It was fantastic. And I watched uh, Horowitz's last concert in Moscow and he's playing that C major sonata, you know, the one, da, 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 that one, that we all did for grade eight. And uh, I was doing my grade eight, you know, I thought, oh, I can play that. Do you know what? He played wrong notes. Well, I'll tell you something. The reviewers didn't say, oh, bloody Horowitz, he can't really play, can he? But he played wrong notes. And then George Schulte, who I work with, just one anecdote, told me this great story. He said that he was at that concert and he went backstage after and he said to Mrs. Horowitz, it was very good. He did very well. It was pity about a few wrong notes. And she said, my husband does not play wrong notes. <laughs> But I, I think, you know, so I think that the, we are very lucky. We have some very young, brilliant artists who do communicate quite spontaneously to the new audience. But the trouble is if they're popular, if, they're, if they seem to be popular, uh, we put them down. And I think that's a terrible mistake for our audience. And we, we've got to stop being posh about it and let people in. So I add one thing to your message, which is like, don't be arrogant, uh, embrace classic becoming popular, even though it might not be what some people uh, expect in technical ways. The key thing is that we get new people into the music and uh, start them to yeah, make... We need, a, we need a young audience. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes I go, I mean, I go to classical concerts, I won't say where, but there's the, really, there's no one in the audience under 50. And I find that really sad. I love classical music all my life from a child. And I, you know, and you notice that, that the audience is very old. So if Lang Lang comes and there's a four-year-old there, I think that's, that's right. You know, we shouldn't be criticizing his playing and putting people off. Thanks, Jen. And what I understand from Hartwig is that he's pretty much focusing on the creative person behind it and is trying with his setup at BMG Rights to take every chance that is there in digital and things suddenly becoming cheaper to make the creative acting independently uh, and is expanding this to also visuals, uh, to moving images, uh, because this is a key way of communication. So thank you all four of you so much from my end. This was my part on it. Now it's your turn, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are still up here for the next 50 minutes to be able to answer your questions. So of course you have got plenty of them and now it's you. Thank you. So it's difficult to see all the raising uh, hands from here because I'm a little bit blinded. So if there are no questions at all, there is a question. ah, okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Dennis Marks. Uh, 20 years ago, I did a part of the job that Jan Young husband does. I was head of classical music for the BBC. Um, I want to take issue with and question three things that Jan has raised, although uh, I don't disagree with them entirely. Um, the three separate but connected issues are, one, where you actually watch and listen to these images and sounds. Because Jan said, and of course she's right, and my kids and my grandchildren agree with her that it doesn't make a difference if you're watching on a television screen and if you're watching on an iPhone. But actually, the kind the kind of material that Jan has been talking about and the kind of material that Deutsche Grammophon and Unitel and so on produce requires a, require a certain level of visual and oral quality in order to deliver what they've got. And the idea that people might be watching live from the Met on their iPhones seems to me to 
to be a debasement of the experience that they're creating at the Met. That's the first issue. So um, th there is, I think, a distinction, and the distinction exists in jazz and world music and classical and, and uh, uh, popular music as well. So that's number one. Number two, um, Jan was talking about uh, the broadcasters no longer being totally in control. And again, that's a very good thing, and it's released the creativity of the company to be the creativity of the communication medium. But what it does at the same time is reduce the level of ambition of the broadcasters and this and particularly those people who fund we're going to be talking about this tomorrow and the day after who fund the broadcasters so that looking at the avant premier uh, over the last two days I have been rather surprised by the low level of ambition, not in terms of the way things are made, which are you know, more skillful and, and technically better than ever, but the range of what's covered. And the third thing, which comes back again to what Jan was saying, you know, that the audience is interested in learning about the context in which the creative, creative Activity happens, in other words, the lives, the ideas, and so on, of the musicians and the composers, and so on. And yet, I have been counting the number of documentary or factual elements in the avant premier, and I would say at the moment that it's less than 10% of what we've actually been seeing in clips and getting smaller. And the same goes for the amount of airtime given by the broadcast television stations to factual programs programming related to the arts and to music and so on. So my challenge to Jan is to say, how do you get what you say, clearly the audience seems to want and need, how do you get more of it on the screen? What kind of battles do you have to fight? Uh, well, I think um, it's true that we've seen a lot of performance, uh, haven't we, over the last, you know, today and yesterday. And I think that's to do with the, the, the cultural broadcaster's responsibility to give access to the great cultural performances, um, which the BBC will be doing more of, actually, and has been doing less of, um, partly due to finances. Um, I think we make uh, as many documentaries as we have always made. And in fact, you, when you see The Real tomorrow, you'll see that we do a lot of documentary. And I've been sitting here thinking, gosh, we're not doing enough performance. but. Um, obviously we do the proms which is a lot and we cover festivals and things but I think the point I suppose it, it's very different in different territories and I've always thought in France for instance that they're very committed to performance in a different kind of way to us um, whereas you know I think you you know as a broadcaster you have to listen to your audience and I I always marvel at the European audiences because I think they're they obviously much more into watching performance than we are in England right now. But I listen to what our audiences tell me they like, and I try and respond to that. And it's changed so much from when I was a producer and when you know I worked for you, Dennis. I mean, I you know I it's changed so much from the days when you would put four or five operas on television a year and spend over a million pounds on that. You know, we just it just it's just changed, and the audience has changed. I mean, I. Where the, the, your point, your first point about the quality of the content, just want to make it clear that we don't make things any less well because they're on streamed or not. I mean, the streaming is the same as the television. Uh, it's exactly the same quality. Um, the one thing I've had to do in the last year is, because of the budget cuts, is which everyone's had, is to insist that there are sound, proper sound people on our films. Because I think the danger of the lack of money is that people double up they double up their staff, and then they turn go out on shoots without proper sound people, which is really horrifying to me. I was doing the same thing tw uh, 20 years ago as you, which is fighting to get proper sound people. But just on this issue of the quality of the image um, that, that the recipient, I am not in this, I'm not criticizing the broadcasters. I said the images, the actual quality of the filming of the clips that we've seen so far, I think has been very high. What I am concerned about are what is what the kids are seeing on their iPhones at the other end. In other words, if you can manage to persuade them to tune into something that is actually of the classical or world music or jazz content that we've been seeing, what are they actually going to see? They're going to see 
if they're watching it on their iPhones, a horribly diminished version of it. No, no if I, I, if I, if I so have a chance to intervene here before, you, before the start an endless dialogue uh, of BBC versus BBC, uh, I, I, also, I, also, I also want to bring one point in there. Like It's uh, historically given. Uh, you have to, to uh, take into account how records sounded when Emil Berliner uh, invented them. They sounded much, much more terrible uh, than any iPhone ever can sound. How did radio sound when you were young? It sounded much, much worse uh, than any stream ever will sound. So, but it made it made you start to get into music. It made you start to get interesting, and it was the first uh, kind of injection of the drug. Music, yes. classical, and uh, that's something that where I'm, to be honest, not that afraid. Uh, I don't. I don't think it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you're watching uh, the Met on your iPhone, that's quite unusual. Most people are watching the Met in the cinema or on their TVs, but. Um, but I don't know that I, I know, th I understand your point, but I don't know that it's worrying. I mean, I'd be absolutely delighted if my 18-year-old was watching the Met on his iPhone. It would be but, a miracle. But, but even if they start uh, with the iPhone, they will see like, hey, I'm not getting the entire picture there. And that will make them end up at the end of the day in the cinema, which is well, a, a good, a good, really first step. I think access is the thing, you know, I mean, I, my son used to watch Friends from, uh, you know, the American TV series on a Japanese website with Japanese subtitles, and the picture was ghastly, but he just wanted to get the next series before we had it in England. And, and he could get it on, some, on a Japanese website. I don't know how he got it, but he did. And so that was about, I've got it before you. And that's where the world we're in with young people. I got Jake Bugg's, I've got Jake Bugg's new single, I got it before you got it. It's not top of the pops anymore. So the next question. Um, yeah, thank you. Johannes Everding from Classica Television, a little pay TV uh, shop in 26 countries for classical music. Um, first, thank you for um, appearing for us and talking to us. I think that's um, always very interesting to get a little bit of insight, so thank you. Um, would you say I understood um, your commentary about um, how the BBC developed and you can get television everywhere and there's no television anymore. Also the breakdown of the broadcasting system in the sense of the only unique holder of distribution audiovisual content? Um, how do I see the breakdown of it? I mean, there was uh, no chance before to get audiovisual content in your home or on your phone or ever if you didn't have a broadcaster because he owned yes. the satellite and now you have that access. And that's also the first clink in the armor of the broadcasting system. Well, I think the self-publishing is obviously the big new news, isn't it? Um, I know Channel 4 got, the, they do festivals as well, and they got the audience to shoot the concert, which I thought was a brilliant idea. I wish I'd thought of that. But um, if you go to the, a big concert hall, a rock concert now, there was a time when you were told, don't use your phone. If you're at the O2 at the back, there's just a sea of phones filming everything. I mean, it must be a nightmare for the labels. I look at that and I think, ooh, I'm glad that's not my problem. And then it all goes on the internet, and then they have people trying to take it all off the internet. But everybody's just going around filming everything on their phones. So that element of it, the self-publishing element of your experience is, is you know, the new exciting thing. Um, but I think we shouldn't be too frightened of it all. No, I mean, no, no. I, I, I don't, agree. When you use the word breakdown, I, I feel the complete opposite. I think it couldn't be more exciting. I, Sorry, you know, that's when just I used English. to make television programs and put them on, you know, Channel Four, you know, one channel. That was it. And now I've made a television program before, before we even got it on air. It's out on the internet and we're going around trying to take it off. So the fact that people want to steal it in, is quite good. But that's what we need to worry about is to stop them being stolen. Yeah. I agree. I just wanted to uh, agree with you totally because it is a real market. Because you, the breakdown means also the breakdown of one audience. Now you attract smaller parts of the audience but more directly and maybe with a different capitalization rate. Yes, it's, I think we shouldn't be right. I mean, I think for a long time we've been a bit scared of the technology. I think we should embrace it. It's exactly. a very powerful tool for us. And I think if we learn how to make really good content for it, you know, it's good for us because we're speaking to a, l a hell of a lot of people more than we were before, you know. Uh, I, th I find it very exciting. Thank you.
I was curious about the context of the one hit wonder and the, all the web things on the internet. Um, you haven't broadcasted anything yet. No, on next Saturday. Right. And what will attract the audience, you think, now before it's broadcasting, if it's just unsync? Are they dressing up in funny costumes or are you yes. talking to. <laughs> they are? <laughs> no, I think, I'm not kidding. I think I've got a. Um, well, good taste in music, and unfortunately, the music media or the music papers in Germany focusing on pop culture, they aren't that strong anymore. They're usually read by only, only by people who are 35 years and older. So I'm, I'm trying to... Um, I think there's so much great music in this city, and I think this music needs an audience. And... I'm like the, I'm channeling, I'm, I'm the one saying, well, these are 16 good bands from Berlin who you never, ever heard of. They are not being played on the radio. They don't have money to make videos. If they make videos, maybe they make them themselves. But, you know, the, I mean, I said it's the, the playback or miming or lip syncing is true to the original format. That's why I suddenly realized it, it's a funny idea. I would have... I would have liked everyone to play live, but this means an additional, let's say, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 euros, maybe, if you do it cheaply, because then you have to record the sound, you have to mix it. And also, those young bands, some of them are quite nervous. So they were actually quite relieved when I said to them, well, it's not about, it's not about playing the right note, it's more about, please think how you want to appear on the screen be it an iPhone screen or a laptop screen or on, on TV. And um, yeah, so it'll be, yeah, we'll, the premiere is on next Saturday and then it'll be on the internet until the end of time. <laughs> May I add one thing? I just, uh, when, I, when I hear all these discussions, I think we have to have in mind, for example, for the Berlin Philharmonic, that TV, the classical TV, is still very important. And we are very happy that we have partners, public broadcasters such as RID and Arte, who are doing tremendous good things for our music. And regarding, for example, we have had the New Year's Eve concert. Uh, uh, broadcasted by Arte, and we've got all together in France and Germany close to 800,000 people. That means something. If you compare it with our DZH, we have 16,000 subs subscribers, and we are telling this is really a success story. It is indeed, but it's the same. We are very happy that we are three times per year on a public broadcaster who is doing a tremendous support, even when it's difficult for them regarding. Uh, the quotes you can get there, or uh, uh, and uh, so it's it's a way we are looking for new ways of distribution, but actually it's we can't substitute uh, uh, the great support and the great energy and uh, what public broadcasters are still doing for us. I think it's perfect to end with this praise for public broadcast. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, John. And uh, again, thank you, Hartwig. And thank you, audience, for your questions and patience.